is exalting Christ through the adversities of gospel ministry. Exalting Christ through the adversities of gospel ministry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's been seven years now, and so we've had guys go out, either plant churches or take churches, and actually quite a few. A growing number. Some of these guys have not graduated yet. They, they're out doing Nick. They're going to be quite a few years, but they don't need to rush it. They're, they're in the ministry. And so we have such a sweet fellowship amongst the pastors and the students. And so you know, you're reminded not only by your own adversities, but just hearing of the, the fight that exalting Christ often is through the adversities that gospel ministry brings. And Paul, he mentioned that very thing in 1 Thessalonians 2. Let's read 1 through 7. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. And he means further opposition in addition to Philippi. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattery speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though, as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority, but we proved to be gentle among you. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own. And then verse 8. Having so fond an affection for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God. But also our own lives. Because you'd become very dear to us. Now what we have here I think is a, a passage. That gives us three things by way of introduction. It gives us a standard to measure a ministry that Christ honors. He says up front, our coming to you was not in vain. He means that Christ blessed it. And the blessing is described in chapter 1. Notice chapter 1. Verse 5. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This is the third time he mentions, just as you know. What kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and the Lord. Having received the word, that's their conversion, having received the word in much tribulation. Doesn't matter when God is working, people don't care if it's going to bring them from trouble. They simply want Christ. With joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone forth. So we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. That's why he says, our coming to you was not in vain. This is the standard of measure for the kind of man that Christ honors in ministry. Chapter 1 is the blessing that Christ brought upon their ministry. Chapter 2 is a description of the man that God used in chapter 1. That's what we have. Now the situation in which Christ was exalted... And Christ honored the ministry of Paul was in the context, his situation was in the context of continual charges and accusations about his character. 
But he points to his record and says, it speaks for itself. Basically is what he's saying. So he gives us specific marks of the kind of man and his ministry that exalts Christ right through adversity with Christ's blessing. blessing. First of all, he says this. The commitment to ministry is and must be unaffected by adversity, unpopularity, and trouble. His commitment has absolutely nothing to do with the degree of perversity, how unpopular it is, or how much trouble it gets him into. It doesn't relate to him. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Now here's what he says. I had a fruitful ministry among you, but let me tell you something. I'd already suffered, in verse 2, in Philippi. Now that is an understatement. If you want to call beaten with rods and thrown into jail, and left there to die, I guess you could say, yeah, that's some suffering. There was an earthquake. A Philippian jailer and his whole household came to Christ. And that mean-spirited biker type became a gentle teddy bear, bandaged him up and fed him. But he says it didn't stop when he got to Thessalonians. You can read the account in Acts. We were, we'd already suffered when we came into town at Thessalonica. We had just left Philippi. But that didn't stop us, in verse 2, from speaking bold in our God. We had the boldness to, in our God. It wasn't natural boldness. To speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition amongst you as well. So basically he says this. The commitment to ministry is unaffected by adversity, unpopularity, and trouble. There is a sincere, authentic pursuit of the gospel ministry and the glorifying of Christ, not a self-seeking show. And Paul could point to his life and say, in the middle of verse 2, as you know, in chapter 1, it also said, as you know. Verse 5, we never came with flattering speech. As you know. He can say, think about it. Did I ever cater to anybody? Did I ever flatter anybody? Did I ever take somebody to lunch because I knew he was rich? Did I ever do any of that stuff? So he can say, as you know. I never did it. So their personal observation of Paul would verify what he says. So his credibility among them was gained by remaining faithful in spite of the sufferings. And that's how the man gains his credibility. It's how he goes through the adversities, sometimes unjust, if not most of the time. He gained his credibility by the way he responded to that stuff and he could point to them and say, as you know. They know exactly how he was treated in Philippi. And yet he came into their city. And he continued to preach and minister boldly. He was real. He was not a show. So... He's sincere and authentic because he's seeking, he's going to tell us later, to be approved of God and to receive approval from God and not men. So therefore, there's a steadfastness and faithfulness in the adversity and opposition and trouble. After we'd already suffered, and then he adds, and been mistreated. He wants you to know it was unjust. What I got in Philippi, I didn't deserve. It was mistreatment. And the prior suffering, the prior mistreatment, didn't deter him when he got to Thessalonica where there was more of it. The trouble and the affliction didn't stop him. It manifested what really drove him. That's what trouble does. 
it manifests what really drives you. Verse 4. We've been approved by God. The end of the verse, so we speak. Middle of the verse, not as pleasing men, but God. It's only trouble that proves that. Now there's a proverb that fits this. Proverb 24.10. If you are slack in the day of distress, your strength is limited. It's the time of distress that is the measure of your strength. It isn't the good times where you find out what somebody's like. And it's not the good times where a church finds out what kind of leaders they really have. That's not when they find out the type of men they really have. So that's why Christ permits it. Listen to Spurgeon speak on this whole matter. A person who has no experience of tribulation, what deliverance can he speak of? Such people despise the afflicted. They suspect the character of the choicest men for lack of power to understand them because people read into your afflictions. They don't understand. Afflictions aren't necessarily God's judgment on somebody. It's God's making of somebody. They don't understand it. So they're quick to judge. What does that man know about the sea who's only walked on the beach? See what I mean? A lot of preachers have only walked on the beach. God says, we're going out into the rough waters. And it's a tsunami. <laughs> what does a man know about the sea who's only walked on the beach? Get with an old sailor who has been a dozen times around the world and often wrecked. And he'll interest you. <laughs> so the much tried believer has great wonders to declare. And these are chiefly the works of the Lord. For they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Tried Christians, tried leaders, see how God sustains in trouble and how he delivers out of it. And they declare his works openly and boldly. And they can't help but do so. They are so interested themselves in what God has done that they grow enthusiastic over it. And if they held their peace, the stones would cry out. So Paul didn't blink. But he says, thirdly, there's a strengthening by God. This is still the commitment to ministry that's unaffected by adversity. Thirdly, there's a strengthening by God in the midst of it to faithfully speak in boldness. He says, notice how he words it. We had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. Notice, the boldness is in our God. There is a spirit-given boldness. It's boldness in our God. It's a strengthening and an empowering. It's not natural, for it's a boldness in our God. It's interesting, I've noticed these kind of things now in the New Testament, where Paul and Luke and Acts and elsewhere were mentioned not merely what they said, but how they said it. And this is sorely missing in preaching classes. It's not merely what you say, the content of what you say, but how you say it. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews, Luke says in Acts 14, and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and Greeks. The way they spoke, it wasn't just the content, the way they spoke got their attention. I agree with Spurgeon that some men have no more gifts to preach than a fence post. And either learning to learn how to do it or get out of it. They were made bold in our God. Paul prayed in Ephesians, asked for prayer, and he said it this way, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
And it's a freedom of speaking. It's an unreservedness of speaking. It's a fearlessness of speaking. It's a Christ-centeredness of speaking. It's a spirit-empowered, Christ-centered manner of preaching. The apostles prayed in Acts 4, Take note of their threats and grant that we may speak your word with all boldness. They were all filled, it says later, after that prayer, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. There is a freedom. There is an unreservedness. There is a presence. There is an enhancement of human faculties that go beyond the faculties. Paul said, the adversity did not not only stop that, it increased it. Uh, go to Second, Second uh, Corinthians chapter four. He says uh, this. He says this way. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Second Corinthians four seven, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. He says, God puts this treasure, this gospel, this treasure, in vessels that are conspicuously weak, conspicuously frail, the languages of clay pots, conspicuously without self-sustaining strength. And he puts it in those kind of vessels so that the power can be conspicuously not of them. So Paul says, I, I came into Thessalonica and, and I'd already been beat up in Philippi, as you know. And I was made bold in my God. Jonathan Edwards comments on this text in 2 Corinthians 4 in his sermon. He said this, if preachers knew perfectly the circumstances of every soul, knew all his thoughts and the workings of his heart, and so knew how to suit the word exactly to, that, to, the, to their case, if he could set forth the gospel in the most powerful, moving, and convincing manner that the nature of words will allow of it, yet if the matter is left there alone and God does nothing, nothing will be done. The soul will be, remain the de same, remain dead as before. There has to be a strengthening and empowering that is in God that takes it beyond the, the man. So Paul says, all adversity did was make me weaker, so I became stronger in God. So, he may had this commitment to ministry unaffected by adversity, unpopularity, and, tro uh, and trouble, and it just is what comes around. I've never met anybody in the ministry that doesn't go through it. It's just the way it is. And what people think is destroying somebody is making them. You know, I've, I was a church planner. Started with 20 people and didn't know nothing. God knows I knew nothing. I, I, wow. And so the way you learn is you make mistakes. And so I made them all. I split our church right down the middle. I mean, I was the main culprit in many ways. Lady come up to me. She walked with a friend to the front of the church right before service, perfect timing, to tell me that God was judging our church and they were leaving. And that they didn't expect this church to even be in existence in two years. I remember this sweet sister. And I remember telling myself, if Christ is in this church, the gates of hell can't stop it. I'm just going to go low, own everything I've done, learn how to repent more than I've ever learned, and ask Jesus to teach me so I don't make the same mistakes again. Over and over and over. 
So Paul was committed to ministry. And it was unaffected by adversity, popular, unpopularity, and trouble. Second, the controlling principle of ministry is the singleness of mind to please God and not men anyway. He says, in First Thess 2, he says this, For our exhortation did not come to you by error or impurity by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. So he makes it clear that the controlling principle, what drove him in the middle of all of this, whether there was adversity or not, was that he was pleasing God who had entrusted him, found him faithful, and entrusted him with preaching. Now, it's manifested, to begin with, by the fact that he viewed what he did, and he viewed the essence of the gospel as the grace of God. He describes preaching, it's kind of interesting, as an exhortation in verse 3. He's talking about speaking with boldness in 2. He's talking about being entrusted with the gospel, so we speak in verse 4. Yet in the middle, he says, our exhortation does not come from error or error error or impurity. He viewed gospel preaching, this is interesting, he viewed preaching as fundamentally positive. Well, why wouldn't he? What's it called? The good news. So he viewed it as fundamentally positive. Isn't that interesting? He didn't leave out the negative. He would never back off from the negative. But it's fundamentally positive good news. So he viewed it as exhorting, as even with the non-believer, as exhortation, as pleading, as appeal to receive these great blessings of the good news, the gospel. So the gospel is an appeal. It's an exhortation to receive benefits. And it continues as believers. God pleads and appeals through the preacher both to the sinner and to the saint, to find in Christ all they need. All they need, as we heard, for justifying grace and all they need for sustaining grace. All they need. that In Christ, we have a fullness, John calls it. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full, full of grace and truth. And all of us have received, watch, grace upon grace. We received justifying grace, but it doesn't stop there. Christ is a fullness. He's a fullness. We then receive further grace upon grace, sustaining grace, preserving grace, helping grace. So preaching is an appeal to saints and sinners to come to this fullness. That's how he saw it. And he says, therefore, because that was his controlling principle, pleasing God and not men, pleasing God and not men, his ministry was marked by a refusal to use any form of unethical practices or deceit. He says, it didn't come with error or impurity or by way of deceit. He didn't Merchandise the truth. He didn't give half-truths, which is error. There was no, nothing unclean about him, no moral impurity about him. He was above board about everything. Nothing could be insinuated about, about him about moral improprieties. He watched how they handled money. He watched how he related to women. He watched every single bit of that stuff. He had no filthy desire for power or money. And he watched it. And he guarded it. He counseled with his door open and he didn't sign any checks. Deceit. There was no deceit. He didn't use methods that were not above board. He wasn't really trying to manipulate people to get their money, their influence. None of that stuff. He didn't buy lunches and cater to people to get them to give. He stayed above board. 
because he was motivated by a desire to please God and not men. Verse 4. Just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. It's very interesting. He says, he's been approved by God, not man. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus the Lord who counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Do you understand, young men, that ultimately elders don't put you into ministry? You say, well, they don't think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Christ is working through them. He doesn't think you're ready through them. Because Christ counts you faithful and puts you into the ministry. Christ approved Paul. It's Dacomanzo. He went through the process. He proved himself faithful at Antioch and elsewhere. He was found to be ministering continually in Antioch when the Spirit of God set, up, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. He was a busy man. His heart was in Antioch. He loved his local church. He was serving in Antioch. And God said through the Spirit, set aside Saul and Barnabas. These men are exhausting themselves in ministry in that local church. They love that local church. They love any local church. They're ready. Set them aside. Paul was a member of a seven-man team at Antioch. He wasn't a big superstar. Read it. There were seven teachers in Antioch. He was one of them. And Jesus found him faithful and said, it's time to set you apart. He said he'd been entrusted with the gospel, which is the language of a treasure. It means to be entrusted with something of great value. The way I preach, how I preach, my motive when I preach has to be guarded. I am guarding a treasure. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you do to me. That's not what this is about. I'm going to evaluate myself by whether I'm faithful to Christ. You know, as the church was shrinking... When the church split, it shrinks. You know, they shrink. You know, that's what happens. It shrinks. And, you know, I was in a rented building with red chairs. Uh, they came out of the netherworld. <laughs> Why in the world somebody would buy red chairs? So every person that wasn't there, there'd be another red chair. Do you remember Karen? And I, I mean, they just screamed at me. When, when the, before the church split, you couldn't see the red because it was full. We had to go to two services. After the split, all I could see was red. And I hated it. I would sit in the front row, and I could feel the empty seats. I could feel them. Honest. It's like they were talking to me. And I'd get up, and I'd stare at those things. So God allowed me to decide, well, why are you there, man? Who are you there for? Let's settle this thing. Let's straighten this thing out right now. Steve? Mr. Servant Man? I'd just done about six weeks before the split on being a humble servant. <laughs> I did. And I used to tell everybody that a servant is somebody who sees themselves as at another's disposal and that really they're an exchangeable part. They are replaceable and exchangeable. And they are really nothing. And they see themselves as nothing. And so I walked up there with those empty seats. And it's like God said to me, so do you really see yourself as nothing? Why are you fighting this? If you're nothing. And I repented on my way up to a sermon one morning. Going into the podium. I was started to repent. Repented. It's not about me, Jesus. It's about you. If you want to take it down to nothing, nothing, I fit that because I'm nothing. And I remember I started to go up to the podium in those days saying this as I went up. I really am nothing. I really am nothing. God be glorified through nothing. Now, I didn't know it, but that sounds like 2 Corinthians 4, 7, right? Treasure in a Worthless pot. I mean, I didn't realize it until years later when I was reading Edwards that how spiritual I was. <laughs> so he was committed to ministry, unaffected by adversity. 
The controlling prin principle of his ministry was single-mindedness to please God, not man. And thirdly, he realized he had a calling to be a steward to remain faithful to a priceless treasure that had been given to him. And so he was committed to this great treasure for the good of people and the glory of God. But notice what he adds. Being entrusted with this gospel, watch this. The entrusted is a perfect tense. Once for all entrusted, gone through a process, found to be faithful, and entrusted with something. All the other tenses are present. So we keep speaking. So not as to keep pleasing men, present tense. But God, and he changes the tense from approved earlier, perfect, he changes it to a present. God, here's the interesting thing, even though he found me faithful, Paul says, and approved me, as I go through adversities, he keeps on testing me to see if I'm still what I was when I got in. It's the same Greek word. So he says, as I go through the adversities, that prior approval, as it were, is contingent on whether or not I'm still the same when I go through the adversity. That's what he says. Well, I just described how that happened to me. I, I went through all the steps and learned to serve in my local church and loved my local church and I was sent out. And I loved my local church. I loved it. I love it to this day, my home church. I wanted it to thrive. Now I've been approved. I'm over in Vallejo. I'm starting this church. We grow. We become... We grow more than I thought we would. We go into two services. It blows up. I make these mistakes. And God says to me, okay now. You, so you say you're a servant, Steve. Mr. Servant. Mr. Model of humility at CBC. <laughs> Preach to those empty chairs and like it. That's what he said. And I did. And I said, I'm going to study more. I'm going to get closer to Christ. And what he does with me, he does with me. And if he throws me away, he throws me away. Because it's just a clay pot. And they throw those things away. All right, let's pray. In fact, would you stand with me? I'm going to give you a chance to stand because we're going to confer the degrees now. I think that's what we're doing, right, Brian? So the song's a little bit later. Lord, you have saved us. You have pardoned us. You have forgiven us. And you have chosen to use us. Everything else is cream. Lord, make us useful. Help us to go through adversities rightly for your glory. And help us now to confer our approval on these men before these saints.